Okay, I am hoping that my audio is working. I'm going to share screen right now. Um, yeah. I could add everyone. Can, oh, can you hear me, by the way? Just checking. Oh, good. Yeah, I could add everyone, but I figured that might bug some people. Like, I would hate for someone to be notified. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll start doing at everyone's for this kind of thing. A ding, like, <laughs> like in, uh, what's it called? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, so I'll give it just a minute, but... So I have not looked at this paper. I have not. I have barely glanced at this paper, at all. Um, so be ready. It's gonna be funny. I I think, because I'm gonna probably make like very little progress. But we'll see what happens. Um, okay. Um. Let's see. Okay, so this is going to be Tacotron 2. And I'm just going to try and implement it. We'll see what happens. But I mean, first of course, I'm going to quickly read through the paper, see what high points I need to look at, etc. <laughs> I'm ready to get, I'm ready to get like clips style and roasted for how for how outrageously unprepared and bad at live coding I am. I'm, I'm honestly excited for this. Um, yeah, so Tacotron 2, the first thing that is good to know that I, that one of the few things I know about this is it's text-to-speech, as seen in the in index terms, so it's just like taking in characters and converting them to speech. Um, they don't use they don't use, it's end to end, I guess, I'm, by my understanding. Let me make sure. They, people usually brag about it if it's end to end. E, I think, yeah. This result points to, yeah, so this is end to end. So what that basically means, by my understanding, yeah, no pre, no post processing. Um, I think there's also another aspect of it, let me think. Um, yeah, it's kind of like um, you you just have the neural network, and that's it. So yeah, so yeah, that's that's the gist of end to end, I think. Um, I'm probably not gonna do any like training because I don't have any data, but um, if we have time, I'll show how to set up a a pretend pipeline. Um, I could download a data set. That might be a good thing to um, include as well, uh, like how to w get a, a little data set of text and speech or uh, yeah, text and speech pairs. But anyway, so um, I th sorry. Oh, this data set. What? Oh, this is. Um, I was <laughs> I don't it I, I I'm guessing it's NSFW giving the titles, otherwise I would definitely use it. <laughs> oh god. Um may I'm trying to think of what a convenient I could find a data set. I'll I'll find one if uh it ends up being if we end up having time. I, I doubt that I'll get past bumbling around the architecture, but... <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so... Um, I also need to figure out what wave to net is. I'm sure, they'll, I'm sure they'll describe it, but that's obviously a very important system, a very important part of Tacotron 2 as well. Um, <laughs> geez. Let's see, okay. Um, we'll start at the very bottom with the character embeddings and talk about it a little bit. Just pure music, no text. You could, I'm sure you could do like lyrics and get like some 
uh, text from it. That'd be cool. Okay. Um, so you get the input text. So you get um, anime kum, you know, whatever. <laughs> and and you have the character embedding. A character embedding is basically. In fact, I'll type this. I'll type this stuff out. Import torch. Import numpy. Import. Uh, what else will I need? Uh, we'll stick with that for now. <laughs> and I'll I'll comment this as I go to, you know, demonstrate how I've learned L4D to couch. It should be already. I don't know why. Let's see. Is this gonna be? Is this going to be outlandish? Oh, an audiobook data set? Oh, that'd be good. Let's see. Um, yeah, I will I will click this and download it after I, once I feel like we're to the place where we can think about data. I, I guess I should, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people would say I should start with the data loading and all of that, but I'm not going to. I mean, maybe no one would say that. Maybe that's a straw man, but. So we have our input text. We have our character embedding. A character embedding conceptually is just basically saying you have A and that is going to have a vector associated with it. You have B and that's another vector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so you're basically turning A into one or well zero technically, B into two, C into three, um, D into four, and after you've done that, you can basically say. Um, Here's a here's a here's a learned set of parameters that's just like a matrix, and you can say, you know, I'm not gonna draw a matrix right now using code, but I'll but but you basically have a table of a whole bunch of different lists of numbers, and then you just index index that table with like one if it's a, you know, twenty five if it's you know w or whatever, and and that allows you to convert you know, um, these characters into numbers. Oh, sweet. I'll, yeah, I'll have to, I hope we get to data today. That'd be cool as hell. Um, but I'll, I'll keep these in mind for, for if we end up getting there. And, and maybe we'll continue with this the next journal club, depending on what people want. Maybe I'll set up a poll about that, but good. Yeah, good, good data sets. I honestly, it might be fun to actually use Tacotron 2 to like, augment like poetry reading for um something like you know hallucinator or anything like that so might be something to work on and have some fun with um okay so you have the character embedding that's basically what that is you have three convolutional layers um, i'm guessing they're one dimensional so they basically just well i don't know let's figure out the three convolutional layers Okay, uh, the network is composed of an encoder and a decoder, blah, blah, blah. A learned 512 dimensional character embedding, that's, we talked about that, which are passed through a stack of three convolutional layers, each containing 512 filters with shape 5 by 1, i.e., where each filter spans five characters, followed by batch normalization and ReLU activations. Okay, so they're, um, they're taking the results of the character embedding and they are running convolutions so they're basically looking at um, filters going over these the result of the different characters um, yeah free speak using techno beats yeah I mean it'd be fun to I feel like just doing text to speech is you know cool but I feel like there are ways you could say like text to you know something similar to speech but some other sound so you could even do like guitar shit i suspect like you could feed in you know here's this chord here's the next chord etc yeah that'd be cool as hell i although i guess jukebox kind of makes everything <laughs> related to that kind of stuff a little bit you know not obsolete but it would it would probably not produce as fantastic results as jukebox which makes me feel sad but they don't use audio. Oh, I guess they don't use. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I a long time ago, like really long ago, I did a long short term memory network that did um, MIDI, but it also did like stacked MIDI, so you could have more than one MIDI note at a time. It was so fun. 
I'll drop my SoundCloud someday, because I literally did have a SoundCloud for it, but it was like, it, it didn't work well. It was like non-music, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, so uh, after the three convolutional layers, they have the bidirectional LSTM. LSTM stands for long short-term memory, and it is a, I mean, it's a recurrent neural network layer, pretty much. Um, and then we've got location sensitive attention. I'm guessing that's like a little uh, transformer. I'm not sure though, but we'll, I guess we'll find out. Um, then they use another LSTM, which interacts with the attention somehow. Um, they've got another convolutional layer, PostNet, that has a residual connection, this plus, or maybe it's concatenating, I'm not sure which. I'll have to look at the, um, the, I'm sure they'll specify what the plus means, but I'm guessing it's either adding or concatenating. Um, then they have this two-layer prenet, no idea what that is. Linear projections to a stop token or to the spectrogram. Uh, waveform samples, wavenet MOL. Don't know what MOL is, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, and a linear projection, generally that's just like having a feed-forward, dense, linear you know, layer um, that takes in the input and you know, projects it, makes it bigger or smaller and stuff. Changes the dimensionality, I guess. Um, like, like you would call you would call the first dense layer in the traditional like style GAN generator or big GAN. What, oh, sorry, not style GAN generator. God, you if you had big GAN, which uses a really big feed forward linear layer at the very start before convolutions. That would be an instance of having a projection, a linear projection. But I guess they're nonlinear because they have an activation. But anyways, that's getting into the weeds. Okay, um, so I guess the first step outside of defining some imports. I'm not defining them, but import. Um, is to figure out just holistically what's going on. A modified version of WaveNet, which generates time domain waveform samples conditioned on the predicted MEL spectrogram frames. Um, I want to know what a MEL spectrogram is. Uh, the MEL fre frequency substrum is a representation of the short term power spectrum of a sound based on a linear cosine transform of a log power spectrum and a nonlinear MEL scale of frequency. Um, so uh, it's a representation of a sound in terms of frequency. That's that's all I think I need to get from that. Um, WaveNet is a generative model of time domain waveforms, produces audio quality, blah, blah, blah. The inputs of WaveNet, however, require significant domain expertise, etc. So Tacotron replaces some of these domain expertise related systems that, and makes it end to end. So you don't need to know you know, much about speech in order to use it. You can just know about neural networks. <laughs> um, yeah, so it replaces the production of ling linguistic and acoustic features with a single neural network trained from data alone. Cool, cool, cool. As the authors know, so before they were using Griffin Lim which is, you know, a kind of traditional approach, which has artifacts and lower audio quality. But WaveNet is better at taking, you know, the output of Tacotron essentially and turning it into, um, turning it into sound. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's pretty. I like how that looks. I love spectrogram stuff. It's very cool looking. So in this work, we choose a low-level acoustic representation, null frequency spectrogram to bridge the two components. Using a representation that is easily computed from time domain waveforms allows us to train the two components separately. Uh, this representation is smoother, easier to train, um, invariant to phase within each frame. Okay, well, that's cool. Uh, it's real, so the MEL frequency spectrogram, they're going to talk about it. Uh, it's related to the linear frequency spectrogram. So like the 
Fourier, tra Fourier transform stuff. Um, da, 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 it summarizes the frequencies. Oh yeah, okay. So it's it's basically just like FFT. So um, so we should know basically that you can look at um, you can look at things in terms of their power over time, meaning like amplitude over time. You can also look at them in terms of their frequency during time, like time, uh, let's see. So you can say like, okay, how, uh, God, I'm so, yeah, so, well, so let's look at this. So this is, in the time domain, you have like how loud it is, or, you know, you have the power over time. You can also say, oh, you have the power over time decomposed into a whole bunch of sine waves. And basically what you're saying is this is, instead of saying like, well, let's see. Um, I'm trying to find a good figure for this. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. <sighs> yeah, every yeah, so you can decompose any sound by saying, oh, it's just a whole bunch of sine waves of different frequencies, and you can say this is how much it was of a certain frequency. Um so yeah, so in um let's see, I just wanna have a good visualization of it, but I don't know if I'm going to get that super easily. So we we can move on. But basically what what's important is you can say instead of like, OK, this is how um, this is how the sound looks in terms of power. You can say this is how the sound look in, looked in terms of frequency over time. And a spectrogram is like a visualization of that. So they're using, they're just using a special kind of spectrogram that is similar to, you know, a linear one. Hmm. Yeah. So this is like a multi-dimensional view and they're doing separate one-dimensional views. Uh, so spectrogram prediction network. Uh, bo, 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 bo. the transform, da, 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 da. This, yeah, this is, the network is composed of an, okay, here's the meat that we are probably interested in. The network is composed of an encoder and a decoder with attention. The encoder converts a character sequence into a hidden feature representation, which the decoder consumes to predict a histogram. Input characters are represented, uh, I think we read this part, but they're embedded, the input characters, so it's not words, it's just like characters, so like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, um, where each filter spans five characters followed by batch normalization and ReLU activations. As in Tacotron, these convolutional layers model longer term context, e.g. n-grams, in the input character sequence. The output of, of the final convolutional layer is passed into a single bi-directional LSTM layer containing 512 units, 256 in each direction, to generate the encoded features. So there's bi-directional um, LSTM. So instead of it being like, we're going to read from, we're, we're going to, uh, so I guess, let's see, what's the best way to put this? Instead of it being like reading where you go, you start from the left and you go to the right, bi-directional means that the long short-term memory unit considers things to the left and to the right if you were using reading as an example. So it's not just it's not just going in one direction. It's reading, it's considering backwards and forwards, hence the bidirectional. The encoder output is consumed by an attention network, which summarizes the full encoded sequence in a fixed length context vector for each decoder output step. We use the location-sensitive attention from 21, which extends the yeah so some article 
which extends the additive attention mechanism to use cumulative attention weights from previous decoder time steps as an additional feature. This encourages the model to move forward consistently through the input, mitigating potential failure modes, blah, 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 where some subsequences are repeated or ignored by the decoder. Uh, let's see. Attention probabilities are computed after projecting uh, inputs and location features to 128 dimensional hidden representations. Location features are computed using 32 1D convolutional filters of length 31. 31 is an interesting 31 is an interesting number, I, especially when it's 32 one-dimensional filters. Don't know why they'd use 31, but maybe they'll talk about it. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. So let's look at the... So what's the, what this basically saying is this is the encoder, right? And then attention kind of bridges the gap between the encoder, which encodes the input text into something that can be used by the decoder and the decoder then steps through um, multiple steps until it stops and produces a spectrogram, a MEL spectrogram specifically. Um, okay. The decoder is an autoregressive recurrent neural network which predicts a MEL spectrogram from the encoded input sequence one frame at a time. Uh, the prediction from the previous time step is first passed through a small pre-net containing two fully connected layers of 256 hidden ReLU units. Okay, we found that the pre-net acting as an information bottleneck was essential for learning attention. The pre-net output and attention context, blah blah blah. So they're basically describing how um, how they decided to use this pre-net part right here. Where they take the previous, uh, did they say previous output? And they feed it through that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the concatenation uh, and the concatenation of the LSTM output and attention context vector is projected through a final linear, sorry, through a linear transform to predict the target spectrogram frame. Finally, the predict the finally the predicted MEL spectrogram is passed through a five-layer convolutional postnet, which predicts a residual to add to the prediction to report the overall reconstruction to improve the overall reconstruction. Interesting. Each postnet layer is comprised of 512 sh filters with shape five by one, with batch normalization followed by tan or ton. I don't know how to pronounce. I use ton activation all the time, but have no idea how to. Pronounce. It. Um, followed by ton activations on all but the final layer. We minimize the sum mean squared error from before and after the postnet to aid convergence. We also experimented with a log likelihood loss um, by using a mixture density network to avoid assuming a constant variance over time, but found that these were more difficult to train and they did not lead to better sounding samples. <laughs> well, I think, I, yeah, I don't know why they'd use a ton. Or why they, I mean, I guess I would avoid sigmoid a lot of the time just because it's not centered around zero. But that probably, it's probably not, yeah, I mean, it, sigmoid and ton are super similar, but um, yeah, and ton is used a lot in recurrent neural networks because it has these properties that make it so the gradient doesn't explode or something. Uh, so there's, there's that. But so yes, this this plus is a residual uh, is is adding together the output from this and the output from this, which is cool. That makes those steppy colors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't. Uh, I don't know. I guess it depends on what you're looking for and what you're using it for. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the sum mean squared error. So instead of saying, so this looks like, in fact, I'll just write it here, loss equals back to definition, criterion. So I'm going to define how it determines the loss. And the loss is going to look like torch.abs um, summed mean squared error. Oh, okay, so torch.square. 
So we're squaring. So we're going to take the summed mean squared error. So the error is the target minus prediction. And we're squaring that. Um, so this is the mean squared error if I add that mean to it. So what we're saying is find the difference between what we want and what we got from the model. Square that so that everything becomes positive and you get like higher values the more off it is. Instead of it being like linear, it's like, you know, it increases as you get, the loss increases even more as you get more incorrect answers. So we're doing torch dot square. So the mean squared error and then the summed mean squared error. So that means we're going to have, I'm guessing what that means is we have multiple steps. So we take the mean aqu across an axis and then we sum across the entire um, tensor. Because if we have, um, if we have like a matrix here, then we can say, okay, take the mean across the last dimension, which might correspond to like a single sample and then sum across all of the samples. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure for certain what it'll look like. Good question. Um, I think that's a good question, whether we're comparing the Mel spectrogram or the um, the wet dot wave or the spectrogram. I think we're comparing the spectrogram. Um, but that is a very good question. I think, I hope they'll talk about it a little bit more. And parallel the spectrogram frame, the combination, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so they also have a stop token using a sigmoid. You'll like that, fractal DNA. Um, that basically tells the um, probability that uh, the, the sequence is stopped. Because we're, we're working with variable length sequences. We could have a sequence that's, you know, five samples long. We could have a sequence that's like 100 samples long, you know. Yeah, but yeah, and, and we I definitely need to figure out if it's the spectrogram or the dot wave that's being compared. I suspect it's the spectrogram. Let's see, let's see. In contrast to the original Tacotron, our model uses simpler building blocks. Yeah, somewhat simpler. Using vanilla LSTM and convolutional layers in the encoder and decoder instead of CVHG stacked in GRU recurrent layers. We do not use a reduction factor, i.e. each decoder step corresponds to a single spectrogram frame. So yeah, so I think it's going to be the spectrogram that we're comparing. And then uh, WaveNet will take... B and then the WaveNet is trained like separately. Um, I don't know... I don't know how that works, but I assume it's trained like on the difference between the um, dot waves. Because the... The wave net, I guess, takes the spectrogram and turns it into actual bona fide, yeah, into a bona fide, you know, sound. Wave net vocoder. This will tell us. We use a modified version of the wave net architecture. There are 30 dilated, blah, blah, blah. Instead of predicting the secretized buckets with the softbox layer, we allow. Um, okay, so. Wow. So they are using WaveNet to create the 16-bit um, samples at 24 kilohertz. So yeah, WaveNet is trained separately to create the dot wave and compared to the, and, and, and it predicts the parameters for each mixture component. So I think a, a, um, a mixture, yeah, I know they mentioned that, uh, MOL. Let's talk about what a mixture of logistic distributions is. <sighs> oh, medium.com. Why predicting distributions than actual values rather than actual values? Um, so, Yeah, so we're, we're basically saying instead of predicting each little tiny thing, we're predicting a distribution, meaning like um, a whole bunch of different, <laughs> uh, meaning basically 
instead of instead of doing a single number, we're saying this is a this is the mean. This is the let's see what else is there mean log scale mixture weight. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see if they talk more about this. So the mean is where the center of it is. The um, log scale is like um, how much it how how well. Let, let me think, log scale. So like it's the little 10 or the little 2, the sub, whatever number, I believe. Again, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so you have the mean, the variance. Variance is like, you know, standard deviation, basically. Um, uh, do, 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 do. I'm not sure which the I'm not certain what the mixture parameter is to be honest. I'm guessing that it's adding together a couple of log distributions. Let's see what this says. Maybe someone knows in the chat. Oh, you VQ again? Yeah, I don't know. You I mean you could probably I because I know that they've used it for images before with like pixel snail or whatever that one's called. Do 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 do. But I mean, so the the gist of this is they're and and like I, I guess I guess what they're basically doing is saying they're just gonna instead of determining the singular numbers, they're gonna do a distribution, uh, specifically logistic. And then um, the loss is computed as the negative log likelihood of the ground truth sample. So instead of doing a subtraction, where instead of doing something like this, where you're subtracting one from the other, you're doing um, you're doing the negative log likelihood, which is like log of well negative log of the likelihood. Um, which could be like cross entropy stuff. I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure how this works in this instance, but like you know, it's the the distinction between log likelihood and um, mean squared error is basically that one is dummy simple, one is um, going to use like logits and probabilities and shit. So there's that. Okay. So they trade the feature prediction networks on its own, then they train the modified wave net independently on the outputs from the first network. To train the feature prediction network, we apply the standard maximum likelihood training procedure. Wait, what the fuck? Feeding in the correct output instead of the predicted output on the decoder side, also referred to as teacher forcing. With a batch size of 64 on a single GPU, they talk about their hyperparameters. Um, what the fuck? The prediction network is run in teacher forcing mode. I need to know what that is. And I, and I was under the impression that they were not doing maximum likelihood. They were using like just mean squared error. Let's see. There's a good chance I will not even finish reading the paper before the end of Journal Pub. So that's. We might have to make this a two session thing. God. We use the atom of, uh, not that. Um, yeah, teacher forcing. Let's read about that a little bit. So, we've got an article on this. Using output as input in sequence prediction. What is teacher forcing? Teacher forcing is a tragedy, uh, it's tragedy, it's tragedy. For, that uses the ground truth as input. Oh, they use this in next frame prediction, from my understanding. So, um, so and so yeah. So you could have Mary had a little lamb, blah blah blah, and you could say instead of instead of having it output Mary and then a guess and then a guess and then a guess and then a guess and then a guess, you say Mary had a little and then a guess. Mary had a little lamb and then a guess. So you're kind of forcing it to, um, yeah. The model will learn the correct sequence quickly. Um, 
So you're you're basically saying we're gonna give it the correct output instead of its own. I mean the correct input instead of its own input a lot of the time. What is that going on? Huh. Okay. We train all models on an English in this data set. All text in our data set is spelled out. That's cool. Uh, yeah, okay. Evaluation. So, they, yeah, okay. So, it's interesting. This is a... This is the kind of thing that I think we've improved with contrastive learning because you could say uh, the dog, God, the dog is your input, and that doesn't mean that there's one single the like there's that there's one single correct um, audio for that, and that's why and that's why using these kinds of methods with labels with strict labels basically might not be as good as using something like clip where you use contrastive loss where you're basically like okay we have 50,000 instances of the dog being said or you know whatever we have a lot of instances of the dog being said and it doesn't have to like the output of the network doesn't have to match the dog being said and it doesn't kind of get an average of all the dogs being said instead it outputs a um vector that tells you like the similarity between the dog being written and the dog being said which seems intuitively to be better to me because obviously there are lots of ways to say the dog and, and constraining the output to have to match you know or sort of match a couple different instances of that doesn't make as much sense as saying okay we're gonna have you um use a more clip approach but anyways that's an aside um, and so they had people write the um, the different uh, outputs of their model. So it's it's basically like mTurk stuff. Oh yeah, M mTurk, where they pay people like a ton of people to write how well they did. A single speaker. Oh yeah, that's true. And I guess I guess there's not as much variance within a single speaker. That's a good point. Um, but you'd think there would be at least a little bit of variance depending on, um, well, yeah, no, that is a really good point. Because it's not like you want a universal um, rating of how text like something, of, of how realistic the text is. You're only looking for one voice. That, yeah, that's a good point. I wonder if they, do they have just like, I wonder if they train, it sounds like they train on a ton of different voices. Um, it'd be fun to condition it so you could say like, okay, here's the voice that we want. Um, try and generate that. I Yeah, I'm sure it's, Tacotron, as cool as it is, seems to be kind of like older. So I wouldn't, oh, sweet. Yeah, I think Adobe had a thing, had a really cool presentation on something like this a while ago. Let's watch this real quick. Is he going to show us? I, I, I hope they... <laughs> it would be fun to, it'd be fun to do a thing where like people get really good at this kind of thing and then they give the presentation and they're like, just kidding, I was lip syncing the whole time. And it turned out it was the neural network doing my voice. Um, but that, yeah, that is cool. I like that a lot. Do, 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 do. Okay. Oh, uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I think that 
I, I was thinking about pivoting to text for, I mean, pivoting to speech for a while or pivoting to sound, but sound is hard when the voices are normal, it works well. Oh, cool. Um, finally, we evaluate samples generated, blah, blah, blah. What else? We ran a separate rating experiment. So they're having people rate things. So that's, you know, whatever. They're, they're not, they're not, they don't have like an exact ground truth that they want to, they, they just want to compare the output and the input. Um, okay. So they do some changes to WaveNet. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to start trying to implement this. Oh God. I mean, this isn't that bad, but it's, it's no transformer. Or you just kind of say, we're going to do the exact same thing, you know, 50,000 times. Okay, so we've got our loss, which will be target prediction. Um, let's define, uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's move on to the architecture. Uh, oh, two. Uh, well, let's type of two. I'm going to go to another collab notebook. One thing I use a lot is my other collab notebooks to, um, so I don't have to remember boring shit like this, you know, so I'm going to use this right now. <laughs> I'm basically a monkey. Um, okay. So what's going on here is we're initializing the network. Let me make sure I'm not missing a colon or anything. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so what we're doing here is initializing the network. We can define um, projection equals torch dot nn dot link dot failure. I need to pull up a GPU for this. Well, I actually don't need a GPU for this since I doubt it'll be running much, but save collection of chunks of code. I could do a copy and paste. Um, accessible all over cloud. Yeah, that would be cool. Where you just like type it, you could even search through like your own code really quickly while without having to like open a whole new tab. I like that. So projection, we're going to do, a, in fact, actually, let's start with the embedding, of course. So car, car embedding or character embedding. Oh, yeah. GPT-4, I want it to replace me so badly. Like, take away my job, please. Not, in, not And I'm not being ironic when I say that. That'd just be cool. I mean, obviously, I need to eat to live, but go GPT-4. Um, car embedding equals... Um, how many letters are in the alphabet? I'm not even sure. Don't quote me on that, please. Uh, torch and embedding. So we have the embedding and we're gonna define it. There's 20, no, there's I know there's more than 22 letters. Right? Am I wrong? Um, this is embarrassing for me. Yeah, I knew it. 26. L M N O P. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to count. I didn't want to have to go like on my fingers counting A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 26 letters. Okay. <laughs> so that's the number of embeddings we'll have because that's the number of, you know, vectors that we'll want for um, turning into numbers basically. No, and the numbers will be learned. The embedding dimension will be, I think it was 512. So we got our embedding. Hallelujah. And now we want three convolutional layers. Next you can say there's not 11 numbers. Uh, let me think. How many numbers are there? Uh, I mean, how many number characters? It depends on how you count, right? Does zero count as a number? I'm, I'm joking. I'm sorry. This is... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say um, there are 10 numbers for sure. I don't know about 11 numbers because 10 is, God, you're, you're all trying to confuse me. Okay. Okay. 
10 isn't a number. This is a take. <laughs> this is a take and a half. Is 500 a number? I think 500 is a number. So why isn't 10? I guess we're talking about digits. It's the, it's the real thing. Okay, so we've got our character embedding. We got our convolutions. Uh, let's see, three clones. Each containing 512 filters, where each filters. Uh... <laughs> um, so we want our convolutions. So we'll start with the first convolution. Oh no, we don't need. Yeah, we can do a list of these. So convolution list equals. I'm going to use a list comprehension, and if you haven't seen one of these, it'll blow your mind. So you do, um, you say what you want, which is torch.nn.conv1d, and we'll define that in a little bit. For i in range, how many did they have? Three? For i in range three, and then you just say torch.nn. I could probably do sequential, but I'm going to do module list. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But So basically, instead of writing out three of these, I can just do three of them like this in a little list and then feed that into module list. Um, so now let's define what's in these 1D convolutions. By the way, they're not two-dimensional because text has, because this text has one dimension instead of, you know, like an image having two, which, I mean, you know, I don't know how obvious that is, but it's not totally obvious, I don't think. Um, let's see, so we've got those, let's figure out how we want to define them. Just give me one sec, I'm looking at some images being generated by latent two visions right now. They're very bad. Well, I mean, no, they're not bad, but they're like, they've got teeth that are very scary. Like, don't get me wrong, I like the new notebook a lot, but it's got scary teeth. My next prompt will be a photo of a man with 500 teeth. And we'll restart in a Okay, so um, we have that 1D. So to initialize the layer, Neural network tries to generate English speech. Oh, I want to see. Uh, should we watch this now? Oh, we've got like 10 minutes. I'll watch this after um, I do this part, or maybe after I do some more. Uh, so in channels is 512. Out channels is 512. Um, kernel size is going to be 5. Um, stride is, we're not going to mess with stride. It's just going to be 1. That'll be good. OK. So now we've got our convolution. So we've got this part and this part, and now we got our bidirectional LSM. Let's do that. And these aren't all hooked together yet, but we're initializing their weights and getting them ready. Reorganizes your thoughts in the four dimensions of time space. God, GPT-3 is so deep. How is it so profound? <laughs> I do love how if you tell GPT-3 to tell you anything, it will just fucking lie to you 90% of the time. But there are 11 digits. That is a thing. That is confirmed. <laughs> okay, so now we want some LSTMs. And we want... I think this is going to be one layer. Sweet. It's going to be... Oh, I hate that they don't list the args up in there. Oh, it is right there, though, so that's fine. Whatever. 512 is going to be the input. The hidden size, I think it's the same. I'm not sure. Uh, layers with 1,024. Okay, so that, wait, what the fuck? No, I'm looking in the wrong place. Um, 
layer can uh, a single layer containing 512 units. Oh, that's convenient. So it's 512, 512, one. Um, bidirectional equals true. So this is just saying 512 input, 512 hidden, and one layer. GPT-3 battle of the battle of them. Um, okay, so we got that. We got our LSTMs. Um, now we need... So we got that, now we need location sensitive attention. I'm guessing this will be the hard part. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by location sensitive attention. I mean, we could start with the pre-net. Attention context vector. Oh god, how do they implement the attention? Well, I mean, I guess I could cheat and look at the code. Okay. Well, no, I'll look at 21 first. I'll do, do, do my due diligence. Oh, God. Scholar.google.com. Oh, it's on archive. Thank God. What if it had been behind a paywall? I would have had to look at the code. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's get to a... Let's, oh, God. <laughs> no. Um, someone give me a diagram that doesn't look horrifying. Yeah, I know. It looks, it looks, like, a, it looks like an Evangelion angel coming down to kill us all. Good God. Um... Ah, ah, I hate that. Yeah, no. Ah, what the hell? Ah. What a nightmare to look at that. It can't be that complicated, but you know it is. The demo notebook. I mean, I, I'll i look at the demo notebook. I'm, I'm giving in on that front because I'm sure the demo notebook looked at the original, um, looked at the, the original uh, TensorFlow implementation. So that'll, that's my... <laughs> we need to go deeper. And it's funny because like you can get a silly, like super deep neural network, but sometimes it's like, not just deeper, but even more weird and obscure. And this, this, try and tell me this shit isn't a little bit esoteric. I mean, come on. Okay, let me find the paper. I feel bad, but I'm, I'm gonna. No oh, shit. <laughs> collab. When in doubt, go to the issues and look for collab, and then. Oh hell yeah. Oh, they're just, ugh, God. Well, I'll look in this code, I guess, since it's going to force me to. Um, hyperparams, layers, ugh, it's so broken up. There's so much going on here, which is fine. I can't, I shouldn't complain. Ugh, lordy. Gonna have to look through 50 files. There comes a point when things can be so organized that they are impossible to use. And I'm not saying that this is the case with this one. I'm probably just being lazy. But sometimes, you know, sometimes. I'm going to search. Oh, let me search Justin here, please. How do I do that? Oh, whatever. I'm going to go into model.pr. Okay, ooh, attention. Let's see how easy this is, or 
how hard it is. Yeah, I mean, that actually doesn't look that bad now that I look at it, but it's not, not fun, for sure. Energies, good god. Alignment energies. Oh, this is, what? This is just attention. Uh, god. Oh, we've got five minutes. Oh, wow. I really thought I'd maybe get the architecture down. But I, at least I initialized three, <laughs> like, three layers. <laughs> well, the only time limit is that I'm going to fall behind on all my work and studies if I'm not a little bit careful. But I'll keep going. Or at least... We can continue next time, but I'll, yeah, I'll keep going for a little bit after. No, you're totally good. <laughs> working studies, who needs them? They're, I hate working studies. No, I don't hate my work. I like my working studies, but oh, very lucky. On this, <laughs> I am only allowed to type out so many numbers on the Sabbath. Um. Let's see. Okay. Well, I'll just keep going. I'll keep going for a little bit, but I, I won't go on too long. In fact, I'll probably just stay here and complain after, or, you know, chit-chat chit or whatever after four, because I don't want people who can't stay to miss things. But, um, yeah, I, uh, that's just a, okay, so let's look at this attention. Before, last thing we'll do. They've got their query, their memory, their location. I don't know. Their query layer, it's just like a query in any attention. Their memory layer, I'm guessing, is like the values. Or no, self.v is the values. All of these are just using like a, you know, a dense feed forward linear network with some kind of normalization. The location layer is what's kind of curious and interesting. So let's find, let's see where it's defined. Um, so, wow, so it's just, uh, a location convolution and a, then a linear norm like the other ones. Uh, the convolutional norm takes in two, oh god, it's just, I'm jumping all over the place. Yeah, does it just take in two channels? What the hell? That's a, that's kind of outrageous. So I guess what's happening is the convolution norm takes in like the position or something, outputs some number of filters, gets run through this, and then it's like, let's see, let's figure it, let's figure out how location layer interacts with everything else. Location layer. Okay. So you query the thing, the self.location layer looks up attention weights cast, which is, uh, who knows what that is. Good God. <sighs> I am, I'm so, I'm not defeated because we'll keep, we'll continue, but Oh God, Lordy. Okay, process query plus process detention weights plus process memory is how they define the lit the energies. Oh, I'm gonna take a nap after this. I just got my COVID shot. That's what I'm gonna blame for me not even getting close to implementing this in one hour. <sighs> My arm hurts, but it's a it's a good time. Nice to like this was my first one, so I still have months to go, but it's kind of nice. Anyway, so yeah, we'll continue on this next journal club unless everyone wants to do something else. I I don't really mind either way, um, but yeah. So it looks like we've gotten. I mean, honestly, not bad. We got through. We got through, we got through the encoder. The rest is just, 
this and then some simple stuff here. Honestly, it, it, it's not even we're not even that far off of getting to the to the Mel spectrogram. So that's good. Mm -hmm, Pre-made by next Sunday. The light and sound. I thought about. I was like, maybe I'll pivot to sound, and now I'm like, maybe I shouldn't, because <laughs> they use some weird stuff. Like natural language processing and image processing are all simple looking compared to these, as Aaron said, these like uh, subway maps. Um. <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess it's a combination, this one. Um, yeah, I'll have to, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, we'll, maybe I'll go over some stuff and get it prepared for next time. But I might just do this again and continue trying to figuring, trying to figure stuff out. You'd think that it would take forever to run. Or I would, at least. Anyways, um, oh, that's cool. Any, uh, I'm going to stop recording, post this on the YouTube. Um, that'll be good.